Okay, everyone, uh, we're very close to getting started, so um, looks like there's, some, there's plenty of seats. Okay. Okay, so I'd like to introduce uh, Ignorance and Peace Narratives in Cyberspace. The speaker today is Angela Crow, and after this, we'll have five or ten minutes for questions. Um, please give her a round of applause. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Um, I'm uh, honored to have an opportunity to speak to this uh, Congress. So, and I'm getting used to this mic, so let me... Um, it's going in and out in my uh, talk, so I'm having to adjust. So, okay. Um, implicitly, um, in this talk, I'm thinking about the relationship between ignorance, surveillance, and cyber privacy. Most of the time, people like me, who I would categorize as largely illiterate on significant trends in cyber worlds, make few decisions that could impact others in any large numbers. Thus, I have lived long uh, with the reality that I and others like me remain only the, at the edges of cyber, cyber awareness and at the mercy of others' wisdom, um, their literacy. This positioning has felt feasible because I have chosen to focus on other areas for literacy acquisition. However, my roles are changing, and at the same time, I'm increasingly concerned about the ways in which local information technology strategies at our university uh, participate with larger national uh, globalized data collection strategies, which seems to occur without extensive oversight or regulatory framings. For this talk, I'm going to look at a specific example of the administrative decisions about the assessment of students' writing at my university. I want to spend time looking at three interrelated inter directions. First, by spending the bulk of this time discussing shifts in university and industry relations to data and the impact on administrative tasks, such as organizing a pretty large assessment um, framework. And second, by discussing that specific problem in terms of the larger issues of assessment being influenced by philanthropists like Bill Gates and drawing on internet savvy and algorithmic savvy companies whose strategies for surveillance may have long futures and worry some tro and troubling implications. And third, if there's time, I want to discuss the challenges of my current um, ignorant an illiterate position and possibly um, some ways of employing resources in the midst of shifting challenges to privacy concerns. Um, I'm looking specifically for the purposes of this talk at policy, policy decisions that we're in the midst of formulating regarding the assessment of students' writing, um, which is a, takes place in a two-course sequence, a pair of courses that students take in their first year at our university, a sort of core requirement that is typical at many universities across the states. So, um, as you know too well, privacy concerns are increasingly compl complicated to articulate and protect. While regulations exist in the United States to pr protect the privacy of students once they are at a university, these regulations are often behind technological changes and capabilities. For example, students must formally waive their FERPA rights if they want professors to talk to their parents. But of course, privacy concerns are much more complicated now, and at times, Referring to FERPA feels rather inadequate. And FERPA is um, the government regulations on privacy for students. Um, I think that's particularly inadequate in terms of shifting possibilities for data. Privacy in terms of internet considerations has long been on the horizon for people in my discipline because we have wanted to know how to work with students um, in public venues and have needed to know how to advise students so that their identities can remain somewhat inaccessible should, should they choose to participate in public venues in which we might assign writing. Many of us have taught this type of course writing sequence um, with internet tools for many years, which include discussion boards, listservs and blogs, wikis, forums, social network venues, um, and you know, at this point, video possibilities. Given the public nature of much of what students do, given the ways in which many of us in our discipline have participated, um, in what David Lyons might term the training of docile bodies for current possibilities sur for surveillance. His specific words are, the more stringent and rigorous the panoptic regime, the more it generates active resistance, whereas the more soft and subtle the panoptic strategies, the more it produces the desired docile body. I think we want to believe that benefits might well outweigh the risks associated with such moves, but it's probably also accurate to say that we have been seduced to embrace the soft and subtle panoptic strategies. While I have in the past come to some sort of position with regards to 
the seduction that I can live with. I think I'm more concerned than I have been at any point thus far in terms of what I think we should be saying about the extended rhetorical situation in which students compose. In part, I think three factors contribute to my um, growing disease. First, the increasing interest in assessment at a local and national level. Second, the ways always increasing use of social networking technologies and platforms and data capabilities, together with the third concern, which is I think the biggest issue for me, which is that our information technology services at our institution are moving away from local resourcing and towards corporate and globalized resources. Um, so, uh, from my perspective, looking at university decisions over the past five years, the people who manage information technology services at our uni university have chosen ways of managing data that rely increasingly on external companies because those companies have far greater oh, I don't have any more there. have far greater resources for security position um, protection. While locally, I don't have someone um, marking this connection, national articles suggest this reasoning behind these migrations. It seems that one of the benefits of a move away from providing services and choosing companies that can provide these services is that these companies then hold the liability for breaches in security. If someone gains access to student data, for example, the university's liability is differently articulated. But this set of migrations comes with a real, rather interesting set of trade-offs both at a financial level and at a data management level. For example, three years ago, the university moved to Google Apps for students, so the students now use an educational version of Gmail, Google Docs, Google Sites, which allowed the university to shift away from students having relatively easy access to the university servers, thus re reducing, to some degree, uh, the amount of time the university spent navigating security issues. I don't know that I need to say any more about these kinds of examples of data management outsourced to Google. I'm speaking to people who know far more about Google's capabilities than I know. But even as a not so uh, literate participant, I understand that the move to Google, despite the ways in which privacy of data may be addressed in terms of FERPA concerns, remains nonetheless a complicated example of an exchange in current privacy definitions. Who has access to students' data, in what ways, with what privacy hazards remains a question, and what kinds of access we have to that same student data becomes a specific concern for me as we try to understand the best ways to gather and analyze a large amount of writing from students who enroll in our composition writing courses, a mandatory course in their first year curriculum at our university. Um, the same course is a mandatory course across um, universities. Uh, in the United States, and uh, we struggle as a discipline to figure out how to best assess students' writing in these larger venues. Um, I want to pause here only long enough to say that in the next section, I want to talk about the increasing pressures to assess students' progress at a national level. We are in the midst of a race towards assessment with many companies understanding the financial value of being able to prove that they can offer the best resources to validate students' work, aka um, a company like turnitin.com, which um, validates whether or not a student has plagiarized writing. To assess students' um, entry level, these same companies try to assess students' entry level preparation to assess the quality of written work with a that a student completes. And as two of my colleagues have repeatedly pointed out, this rise in the assessment industry has not seen a corresponding rise in regulatory agencies that might set and enforce viable policies. What's more, in the midst of budget cuts and extreme financial challenges, we are asked to prove the worthiness of our first year writing courses using data that would most easily be gathered at this point by drawing on data cloud resources from the internet, at least for some portion of that required labor. In other words, in the midst of an extraordinary budget crisis and with increased pressures to prove the, val validity, the validity of our courses, we find ourselves trying to create viable options that reduce the enormity of the task before us. And because companies have understood the pressures and expectations, they have created the resources we might need. Nonetheless, we find ourselves worrying over the potential threats of looking into data cloud options in this midst of our ignorance about how data will be used by these various corporations, I nonetheless need to make viable and often hasty decisions about which resources to try. Um, and I should add that the stakes are high in a variety of regards, not only in terms of student privacy, but also in terms of disciplinary identity concerns and in terms of local faculty concerns. 
The assessment trend within our discipline and others is towards gathering portfolios of students' work in online venues over the course of their undergraduate careers, and universities often select portfolio services offered by companies who also facilitate the assessment process. Who pays for this resource? Inevitably, at our institution, I think students will pay. Whether students pay the service explicitly in a composition course, or they play implicitly because the university negotiates a contract with a service like Chalk and Wire, at a school like ours, um, it might pay for this kind of resource with fees collected from students' um, technology uh, funds. This troubles me, to say the least. Um, so the desire is to somehow come up with an alternative, but then I run into security issues and concerns and an ID, IT department that is hesitant to increase its security risks. So um, when we look at the data cloud options that might facilitate our assessment process for a program like ours, and we're looking at trying to assess 3,000 students writing each year, um, we come up against uh, the privacy and surveillance challenges that I would like to explore, particularly from the ang angle of um, someone who doesn't quite know what, what, what these uh, companies are capable of doing. My rhetoric always when I talk about assessment requirements that we face is to argue that whatever assessment we create needs to help us learn more about our program so that we can facilitate the jobs of teachers and thereby the learning for students. But increasingly, I think the assessment process will be determined by forces and people who have different takes on the assessment than I think we want to take in our discipline. And as we make these decisions, I want to keep in mind three small examples. Um, the first one involves um, a NUN study that was done um, involving some from the University of Kentucky. Um, they had a group of nuns who agreed to um, donate their brains to science after they died. And so one of the things that was possible was to go back to their early entry autobiographical essays, and from that essays correlate who um, who was most likely to get Alzheimer's as they aged. So there was some indicators of that Alzheimer's in the early writing. Uh, Susan Kemper, a cognitive psychologist and psycholinguist, was able to take the autobiographies from these humanities-based school teachers that they um, asked to write these um, documents when they entered the convent and predict the probability of Alzheimer's from their sentence structures at 18. Luckily, replications of this kinds of research are difficult, and I say luckily because these kinds of findings might have potential hazards for those whose writing at 18 um, indicates uh, whatever kinds of problems. Specifically, living in a country in which healthcare is not a fundamental right, um, insurance companies might want to access this kind of data. I give this example using old school framings of files and hard copies of data because I want to suggest the durability of data, but also the potential hazards. And second example that I think about as we decide um, issues is that most of the text that our students submit online will then be used by particular companies um, in what we could call forensic stylistics in linguistic studies so that we, their particular writing can be used to help detect plagiarism and also um, to detect patterns in texts, patterns that can be correlated to particular scores with machine-based analysis of students writing strategies. When I think about using data from our students in an online program focused on linguistic patterns, I'm participating in a similar set of moves to those that exist at places like Pearson or ETS, the Educational Testing Service, and ACT. Um, I think any time we're submitting data at this point, uh, they're using that data for uh, their, their needs. Um, finally, um, in the era of the Virginia Tech shootings, a situation that was very curious um, for issues of student privacy recently came up when a war vet student in the Baltimore, Maryland area was banned from his campus after he wrote a paper for a writing class about his relationship to his training in the Army and his experiences of killing people. I should say that his teacher encouraged him to publish this in the school newspaper, and because his essay was then seen by his school administrators, they called him in for a meeting and banned him from campus until he was evaluated by a psychologist. Hope Davis, a college spokeswoman, said, the violent and inflammatory content of Doc Mr. Whittington's article raised some red flags we felt we needed to address in this post-Virginia Tech area. 
We have an obligation to maintain a safe and comfortable learning environment for the diverse population of nearly 74,000 students that we serve. Um, students write all kinds of things in um, first year writing classes at university, and I think we should be very careful about who has access to being able to do strings of data from that and, and, and pulling out particular students that they determine are dangerous. Um, so the student's essay raises two questions for me. One, um, it's a concern of whether a student's text will be more easily scanned and tagged because of specific uh, syntactical strings that mark a student as dangerous. But it's also true that the student's essay and others from the student school becomes a marker within a data bank of the level of development and complexity of students writing at that institution. And the, um, that's interesting for issues of university rankings, particularly when organizations outside universities are helping to shape assessment concerns. Depending on program framings, depending on limitations to data collections, whose data will be seen as adequately robust remains to be seen. I think about our own data collection decisions and how data may or may not offer a valid snapshot of what might be happening in any of our classes. We are charged with creating an assessment plan for a first year writing program, a program that teaches about 3,000 students a semester, and we work with those students for two semesters. So those 3,000 students create about 24,000 documents over the course of those two semesters. Um, faced with the challenges of somehow adequately adequately gathering a snapshot of that labor, and um, I start to have a sense of why data clouds become interesting to me. Because obviously we can choose to um, get at that data much more quickly and much more efficiently based on programs that are out there. Um, for the sake of showing some of the possibilities, let me suggest some of the ways that people approach this labor within our discipline. Some um, writing programs use mycomplab.com by Pearson, which is um, used to facilitate assessment while also providing a more viable program for students. In other words, if students will support financially the challenges of assessment, this option offers them a range of resources that would be handy while writing. So you're not necessarily only just um, telling them to char charging them for the, um, for the program, uh, the assessment part. So my um, CompLab includes a portfolio option, which allows a student to upload all of his or her writing for his or her class, a portfolio framing that allows an administrator like me access to all of the classes in our program and all of the writing from students. Pearson, by the way, has shaped the way that they input that data so that um, it's much easier for them to um, move through it quickly. They've only finally allowed for you to have different kinds of um, documents within it so that it can actually reflect the kinds of writing students do. Um, Google uh, is the next option that people use at a national level for this work. Um, local IT specialists can create templates and framings that allow a program like ours to adequately gather and even perhaps assess the data without a lot of coordination. And the IT department relies on Google to provide protection and security. Um, we have something called Georgia View, which is a uh, a version of WebCT, which Blackboard bought quite a while ago, and, and they're getting rid of WebCT, thank God. But um, like my complex, students and teachers can upload documents. The problem comes in this one in extracting the files, creating the databases, and organizing the logistics of reading the files, entering data, and compiling scores. There are um, several of these professional companies, Chalk and Wire, Task Scream, and Life. Live text, um, and I've been trying to see who they might be related to in larger um, framings. So it's, uh, Pearson is a pretty strong, uh, large company, and so they may actually be subsidiaries or about to be subsidiaries of, of that kind of company. So um, Chalk and Wire is a program developed by the Communications Research Center in Ottawa which facilitates not only the uploading of portfolios, but the reading of the text by the faculty and the data analysis. What's very interesting about all of these programs is that they're not subject to any government regulation that I can tell. So um, it's a really a, a curious uh, industry. So, and then there's a variety of DIY options, do-it-yourself options. Those, of course, come with the, the risks that we, that we face.
Um, in the midst of computer gurus, the kinds of descriptions I have here are not that intriguing, perhaps, but for those of us who struggle to sort out possible viable decisions, there's a set of literacies that are not accessible, and those who might discuss the implications of certain moves are not necessarily able or willing to discuss the hazard hazards of various decisions. And so it becomes unclear whether one is engaging in necessary or unnecessary hand-wringing, worrying over what will happen when our students submit their data to these places. For those of us who must do assessment in the time of fleeting resources with few remaining internal options, these external companies suggest viable resources, but they trade in data and algorithms in ways that are always unclear and the ability to make informed or wise decisions about privacy feel limited at best. That said, I think there are relatively simple solutions to the set of concerns um, that involve gathering a network of scholars through online networking scaffolds who are in field and who can provide our own ranking and rating system for each of these companies based on our own criteria for assessing their policies, their relations to philanthropists, to think tanks, and to politicians. We need, in other words, to access data cloud options and provide data as a collective that may help us to turn uh, communicate to in turn communicate with these corporations. It's very clear that we're, we're very separated out in doing this work across the nation and yet this work is um, would be much better uh, put together if we if we did collaborate in some way. Um, I want to talk just a quick minute about um, assessment and philanthropy and the sort of larger scale issues that I see uh, pushing this assessment uh, in its current climate. Um, I would be less inclined to join forces to figure out why, ways to articulate the implications of various resources if there weren't also this rising and troubling interest in assessment that I would argue is driven um, by influential philanthropists. While it is not within the scope of this talk to tar articulate this, um, the influence of individuals like Bill Gates, if I had more time to create the argument, I would try to suggest that in the midst of the loss of tax revenues from the wealthy for the government, with the rise of philanthropists who get to choose where they donate their money to education, um, they are able to, to control the conversations and the directions for assessment within the United States more than they may um, have in the 80s and 90s. You can see debates over these kinds of values and who should win in um, exchanges between Bill Gates and Diane Ravitch. So the relationship between education and philanthropists always has existed. Their influence at this point feels pervasive and ominous and without government regulation. So that the rise in assessment imperatives colludes with this data management in ways that would make your average academic like me prone to paranoia. You can see the scope of this influence in companies who are working to participate in significant uh, assessment services. Um, you can take Pearson, for example. Um, in 2003, they acquired Edexcel, a company that provided testing in England and in 85 other countries. Recently, they've been involved in submitting a bid to provide testing for the PISA uh, assessment, and they have a developed technologies that automate the assessment of writing and speaking, a curious move for the likes of people like me. The future prospects for uh, Pearson are extensive, and in, what is interesting to me is to see the strategic gathering of data that can later be used in ways that are not seen at the time. So when a teacher is required to use my comp lab because a writing program decides uh, it's a valuable tool for assessment and also for students trying to sort out the challenges of writing, and students submit extensive numbers of written documents as part of a portfolio, Pearson gathers data that later can be used to create additional resources for university writing programs in assessing viable entry points for students or in providing resources similar to turnitin.com. And these are incredibly um, powerful companies at this point who make a good dollar off of um, students. So um, I've mentioned this uh, concern several times in this talk, but I want to say it again. What is perhaps most troubling is the places like Pearson develop tests without regulatory oversight. People invited to participate in their conversations about the assessments are strategic, but not necessarily representative of a disciplined sense of what should be assessed. With this example of Pearson and the example of Bill Gates, um, while this example does not explicitly address surveillance, at this point I think I've established enough, a, enough of a suggestion of the ways in which a student and faculty data might be mined. I think it's not a leap to suggest that at this point various intriguing trails of data are available for those interested in surveillance. And if I had more time, I would slow down here and explain the very large concerns that I have between histories and traditions of surveillance and the move to a larger assessment agenda. 
However, I'd like, to, I'd like to close by suggesting just one viable strategy for addressing my own ignorance and liter illiteracy. Um, Peggy O'Neill and Linda Adner Kastner argue that following the following about the need to participate in the assessment discussions happening in a variety of venues. Um, these assessment discussions affect everything about our courses and programs, who is admitted to them, how they are taught, how students, courses, and instructors are evaluated, what counts as valuable in them, in essence, everything that motivates writing instructors to do their work. I would add to O'Neill and Adler Kastner's argument and suggest that we should not only try to sort out uh, strategies for participating in existing discussions, discussions that often occur far outside the range of writing experts, but we should start to develop criteria by which we judge programs that facilitate our assessment practices. We should routinely investigate these companies and be aware of the consequences for programs of faculty participation with these corporations. And we should publish our results, regardless of our alliances with different corporations. At this point, writing um, faculty are often targeted by these corporations, and you become a Pearson person or a, a Bedford person. So, um, while each department's decisions about assessment are minuscule in the large picture, they contribute significantly to the amalgamation of data. We should be taking a more active, collective approach by setting the guidelines and responsibilities. I should conclude by saying that there are some very interesting faculty and field who have been doing this work for a long time. But in the main, people like me continue to make decisions about assessment without an adequate network in which discussions about viable options can be heard. Thank you. Uh, microphones. Okay. Well, thank you for that. That was really fascinating. Uh, does anyone have any questions for her? Okay. I'm going to come bring the mic to you. Hi. Uh, I have a prior question to the sort of questions you're answering. I think it might enable us to understand uh, a bit more the challenges that you're facing. Um, you said that you're assessing 3,000 students per semester on this course and they submit 24,000 pieces of work or something like that. Yes, yeah, um, how many How many teachers or teaching assistants or how many different people are assessing these 3,000 students? Well, those are the sort of questions you have to decide when you set up your assessment plan. So what we're trying to do is pull from the data from students, um, maybe selected sampling, and then the expert readers will be from the faculty who uh, teach the course regularly. I'm just trying to get an, an idea of the sort of workload that an individual yeah. assessor would be under. The, the main thing that, it depends on the university and it depends on what kind of funding is available. So what we're, we're going to try and do is the minimal. Um, but some uh, universities look at every student's writing over the course of their college career which is an extraordinarily large task. We don't, and we won't do that until there's funding for it. The, the reason I ask is because I'm from a, as you might be able to tell from the UK, from a slightly mm -hmm. different background, mm -hmm. uh, where we're taught in, well, I was taught in extremely small groups of people, right, so I'm, right. it's quite a cognitive stretch right. to be able to understand the, the, the way you're right. going about it. Um, just the second part to that question then. So what sort of feedback do the assessors provide to the students? What, what does it look like? Yeah, this, this again depends on what kinds of programs you use. So if what we do is look at every student, then what we can do is maybe set up a particular type of um, program that gives feedback to each student. But in this case, uh, students will likely have no feedback from us. So this is only to assess the, valid, uh, the validity of the program. So, but it is, this is one of the few places in the United States universities that are state kinds of places where students have small classes. So they're typically taught by one, one to 25. So one professor, 25 students. They should be at one to 15. So that's where we're at. Um, does anyone else have any other questions? Raise your hand. OK. Um, I have one, actually, which is uh, how how strongly regulated um, are the companies providing those services with regard to FERPA? I mean, how, how well do they respect the law and how strong is the law? You know, this is a place where it's difficult to know. I mean, I don't have the, I, that's not my area of specialization, so I don't know um, to answer the question. But 
the people in my um, my discipline who who look at this are are always exceedingly nervous. So I, in part, the the data management, it's very clear that Gmail, for example, Google Docs and Google Apps are are mined by Google. It's also true that when they were through the university's um, systems, they were mined as well. So I mean. Who has access to that data and what kind of length there is to that data is where I get interested. Thank you. Okay, um, yeah, can we give?